Double Identity, Chapter 25 I fight my way back towards consciousness through an awful darkness and a throbbing pain in my head. Seriously injured, Joss is saying. I don't think so, Merle says. My hearing goes in and out, so I only catch part of her next words, in shock. I have to get back to the phone, have to get my mother to take back those words she just said. You did not copy Elizabeth. You didn't. You couldn't. I managed to raise my head and reach my arm towards the phone, which is dangling by its twisty cord over the edge of the counter. But then I hear what's coming out of the phone, the empty, monotonous dial tone. I drop my arm. What happened, Merle says. She's hovering over me, her anxious face seeming to float above mine. Somehow I've ended up with my head in her lap. She is stroking the hair back from my face. What did Hillary say? I open my mouth, but I can't speak. I probably look like a guppy. Joss crosses the kitchen, presses a button on Merle's phone. My mother's voice spills out. Your father says it can get you back. Oh, Elizabeth, we'll make a copy of you. A clone. It's not possible, I say, finding my voice at last. But Joss and Merle are both looking down at me now, and their faces say everything. Bethany looks exactly like Elizabeth, even down to the lopsided freckles on her cheeks. Bethany likes the same foods Elizabeth liked. Bethany's voice sounds like Elizabeth's. Could it be? I scramble away from my aunt and my cousin, moving backward on my arms and legs like a frantic crab. I crash into a cabinet. I'm not that much like her. She was a gymnast, I yell. But I can hear my old gym teacher's voice echoing my head. You have a lot of natural ability. I sag against the cabinet doors. Is it possible? I whimper. Merle and I both look at Joss. Joss, the biology major. They cloned the first sheep in Scotland when I was still in college, he says slowly. This wacko religious sect, the Relands, came and have produced a human clone years ago. Everyone assumed that it was a hoax, but maybe. Walter went to medical research after the accident, Merle says. Joss frowns. Oh, Mom, human cloning would have been such a long shot 13 years ago. It'd be a long shot now, because there have been so many laws passed against it. There's no support for it. For Uncle Walter to have cloned Elizabeth, it would have taken years of research, meticulous attention to the DNA, millions of dollars. She stops, and I can tell that she's thinking of those crisp $100 bills my father sent us. I'm not a clone, I scream. I'm a real person, not just some, some exixer of Elizabeth. I'm Bethany, Bethany Cole. Then I remember that Cole might very well be an alias. How can I... How real can I be if I'm not even sure of my last name? She was lying, I scream, more frantically now. My mother's delusional. Joss and Merle stare at me, and I can tell from their faces that one of my favorite words, delusional, has been one of Elizabeth's favorites, too. I leap up and flee the kitchen, as if I can run away from everything Elizabeth was, as if I can run away from myself. Chapter 26 I fling myself out of the front door of Merle's house, across the porch, down the stairs, out the gate. I'm running blindly, stumbling over my feet, falling, scrambling back up. I'm not watching where I'm going. I find myself in the middle of the street, but it doesn't matter. The only car lights are a block away. I dash back onto the sidewalk, force myself to pay enough attention to stay on concrete, not asphalt. My body takes over, working into a rhythm as natural as swimming. Running is not my sport, but I can do it without thinking. My feet pushing against the pavement, my arms pumping hard. I like to run and paint and read and watch TV and go to movies, Elizabeth had said on the videotape. Running was something else that belonged to her then. Half panting, half crying, I slow to a fast walk. But walking is a mistake because it makes it easier to think. Where am I going? I'm in a strange town and it's dark and I'm lost now. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't find my way back to Merley's. And I don't want to go back to Merley's. I want to go back to Greenleaf, Pennsylvania. Back to my old life. Back to six months ago. When Mom didn't cry, mostly. And Dad acted normal, mostly. And I didn't know anything about Elizabeth. It's not possible. I look around, searching for some recognizable house or street sign. But the houses are dark, the street signs covered in shadow. I can't even see the moon or stars. Just dark clouds pressing low, crowding down against the treetops. I have never before been outside by myself after dark. Certainly not lost in a strange place like this. Not when I'm already bewildered and distraught. 
I have no hope of navigating my own way to safety. I hear footsteps behind me. It makes me think of all the things my parents have always feared for me. Young girls kidnapped from a dark street. Young girls killed or left for dead. I take off running again, speeding through the darkness. My leg muscles cramp and burn. My breathing comes out ragged. I can't run forever. Eventually I'll have to stop. Eventually I'll be caught. Someone is shouting behind me. Wait. I trip and sprawl across the ground, a searing pain in my leg. Bethany? It's Joss. She's running toward me, breathing hard. Are you okay? She pants. I stop struggling to scramble back up. It feels good to give up, to lie still. Joss collapsed on the ground beside me. I was lost, I blubber. I didn't know where I was. Town Square now, Joss says, still trying to catch her breath. We were about ten blocks away when you started that sprint. Man, I'm feeling old. I roll over and sit up. We're on the courthouse lawn. I just barely missed falling into the terraniums that Merley was so proud of planning. What I tripped on, I realized, was one of the steps leading to the memorial of Thomas Wilker. I thought I heard someone, I say, chasing me. It was probably just me, Joss says. I didn't want you wandering around in the dark all by yourself. Her face glows with concern, and in spite of myself, I'm glad that she followed me. But I keep replaying these footsteps in my mind, and they sound too heavy, too big, too ominous to belong to Joss. Anyhow, you're safe now, Joss says. She reaches over and brushes the hair on my face. She peers at me, her eyes brimming with sympathy. What is it this symphony? But it's that symphony really for me. Or do you see when you look at me, I want to ask her, me, Bethany, or Elizabeth, magically brought back from the grave. I remember that Joss said by accident, only the night before, Oh, Elizabeth, it's so nice having you back. Is that how my parents felt every time they smiled at me, every time they kissed my forehead, every time they hugged me? Did they ever love me just as me? I look around at the town square shops, dark and quiet and dead again. This time, I don't think of hibernation. I think the villagers are in Sleeping Beauty, who went to sleep for a hundred years while their princess slumbered. My brain shies away from the scientific implications of what my mother said. All that talk of cells and clones and DNA. But I can see my parents believing in something like the fairy tale ending. Their beloved daughter magically revived. Their other beloved daughter. It can't be true, can it? I asked Joss. What my mother said? Tell me she was lying. Tell me. Tell me. I'm begging now, as if Joss has the power to change lies into truth, truth into lies. But Joss is shaking her head. I can't tell you that, she says. I don't know if it's true or not. All right, I say. You don't know answers, just questions. I choke out a bitter laugh. Hey, guess what? I bet this is one question you didn't ask when you were 13. Bethany, Joss begins, but I can't listen to her right now. In the dim light, I look down at the palms of my hands. Raw and red and scraped from my fall in the concrete. My hands, I say, but are they mine? Or are they Elizabeth's, revived, recycled, restored? Can I not even claim my own body as mine? This is ironic. I'm terrible at sharing. Everyone knows that. And now I'm expected to share not just my parents, but my very self with some dead girl. I remember when I was five, and Gretchen Dunlap from across the street just wanted to touch my Cabbage Patch doll. My Cabbage Patch doll, I think. Oh no. Revelation is breaking over me, and it's horrifying. I clutched Joss's arm and cut off whatever she was starting to say. They gave me Elizabeth toys, I say weakly. I just realized this. My Cabbage Patch dolls, my Little Pony videos, my original unenhanced Uno game had been, hadn't been antiques, lovingly reclaimed from a past just for me. They'd been Elizabeth's. Yesterday, I'd creep myself out thinking about Elizabeth's possessions locked up in my basement or in my attic just a floor away from me but they hadn't been boxed up and stored away they'd been in my hands i'd cradle her dolls in my arms when i was little i'd snuggled up in bed with her stuffed animals practically every single night of my life lots of kids get hand-me-downs joss says mildly trying to sound casual i had a friend in college who was the youngest of nine she didn't own anything that hadn't belonged to one of her other siblings first but your friend knew that, I say. She knew what she was getting. She knew she wasn't the original owner. That word original hangs in the air. I had to make myself talk past it. I didn't know anything about Elizabeth, I say. 
I think about the elaborate way Mom and Dad presented me with my collection of antique toys. The first Cabbage Patch doll arriving on my fifth birthday. The Ono game that same Christmas. I think about Mom saying they wanted an exact copy of Elizabeth. I think about my science teacher saying people are shaped by their environment, as well as their genes. Oh no, I moan. They were using the toys to try to make me just like Elizabeth. Joss is hugging me tight now. It feels like she's holding me together. They didn't make you take gymnastics lessons, did they? She asked. They didn't. In fact, they refused to let me become a gymnast. I hold on to that. But gymnastics is something Elizabeth had that I didn't. It's not much of a consolation. Was she? Did Elizabeth? I can barely get the words out. Did she like to swim? Joss blinks down at me. No, she says. Elizabeth hated swimming. Relief floods over me. Here, finally, is something of mine that Elizabeth can't touch, can't ruin from beyond the grave. But the relief washes away quickly, leaving me still huddled in fear. Why, I ask. What's wrong with swimming? I hate the way I've said that, as if whatever Elizabeth thought was the proper view. What was wrong with her, I say, a little too viciously. Joss winces. Elizabeth almost drowned when she was really little, she says, at the Sanderfield pool. Her voice slows down, as if she's straining to dive back into the memory. Elizabeth got knocked down or shoved under. No one was ever quite sure how it happened. But then she was underwater and trying to breathe, and no matter how hard she tried to pull in air, she couldn't. She could only choke. Elizabeth could make such a scary story out of it. I can remember Elizabeth telling that story at sleepovers and around the campfire at gymnastics camp. Did they have to give her an artificial respiration, I ask? The lifeguards or mom? Somehow, I can't imagine mom responding very well to an emergency like that. Oh no, Joss says. It never got to that. Later on, mom and Aunt Hillary always said Elizabeth exaggerated the whole story. That she couldn't have been underwater for more than a second or two. But Elizabeth refused to put her face in the water after that. Every year, Aunt Hillary signed her up for swimming lessons, and every year Elizabeth stood on the side of the pool and wouldn't even dip her toe in. And then we got into gymnastics, and Aunt Hillary stopped trying to make Elizabeth swim. Did you learn to swim? I ask. Not until after Elizabeth died, Joss says. Don't take this the wrong way, but swimming was kind of my declaration of independence from Elizabeth's memories. It can be mine too, I think. I swim and Elizabeth didn't. There's no way I'm her clone. Then I remember how I fell in love with swimming after accidentally slipping into the water when I was three. I remember my parents' amazement that I liked being underwater, that I begged to go under again. Were they trying to reenact Elizabeth's experience? They expected me to hate it, to panic, to be like Elizabeth and never step foot in the water again. But I took a breath before I went down. Was that the only difference? Could Elizabeth and I have the same genes, but she hated swimming and I loved it, just because I'd had the sense to take a quick breath when I was three. And my parents let me be different, I think. Somehow this makes me feel good, that my parents hadn't pushed my head back underwater until I choked, forcing me to be exactly like Elizabeth. But what kind of parents would do that, half drown their own child on purpose? A shiver in the night air, the sweat from my panicky run finally drying off. For the first time, I realized that I left Marley's house without so much as a jacket. My Greenleaf Swim Club t-shirt has long sleeves, but it's lightweight, virtually no protection against the autumn breeze. We should be getting back, Joss says. Mom will be worried to death about us. She stands up, groaning about her stiff, sore muscles. I try to stand too, but my leg throbs and I fall again. I hurt my leg, I say. I'm not sure I can walk on it. Let me see, Joss says. She crouches down and tries to roll up the leg of my blue jeans, but the jeans are caked with blood. Ow, I moan. Sorry, Joss mutters. I turn my head and see a black car turn the corner and drive slowly, no crawl down the street between us and the row of dark shops. It's the first traffic I've seen in the silent dead town square the whole time Joss and I have been sitting here. I'm puzzled. Did I hear the car coming from far off in the distance? Or was it sitting over on the other side of the courthouse the whole time? Did it just now start up and start rolling towards us? I can't be sure. The car pulls to a stop in front of us, angled across four empty parking spaces. A passenger side window slowly sides down. Is everything all right, Joss? A man's voice calls out from deep inside the car. 
Anything I can do to help? Josh turns around and squints towards the car. The man's face is totally in shadows. I'm sorry, do I know you? She asks. It's been a long time since I've lived in Sanderfield, and no reason you should remember me, the man says. But he doesn't tell her his name. He doesn't lean forward into the light. Need a ride? It looks like Bethany banged her leg up pretty badly. At least this guy didn't mistake me for Elizabeth, I think, feeling so relieved that I forget about the pain in my leg for a moment. But then I wonder, how does he know my name? Um, Joss says, she's looking back and forth between me and the man in the car. I can tell she's debating whether it's safe to go with him, whether she can get me back to Marley's house without him. Another car turns the corner much more quickly than the first. It toots a short of a siren horn, then pulls in the proper angle in front of the other car. This one's a police car. Looks like help has arrived and you don't need me, the man says. Bye. He rolls up the window, puts the car in reverse, and maneuvers out past the police car. He waves as he drives off. How did you know my name? I want to scream after him. Why did you drive off so quickly? Were you scared of the police? How did you know my name? Joss has turned her attention to the officer climbing out of the police car. Bridgie, she calls out delightedly. That's Officer Ryan Bridgman to you, the cop says. Oh, come on, Joss says. I'm the one who caught you stealing cookies in kindergarten. And you convinced me to change my ways and turn away from my life of crime before I got in trouble with your mom. Officer Bridgman glances over his shoulder, his eyes following the car that's driving away. He turns back to Joss. We've had several reports of someone running through town in obvious distress. Those were Miss Wade's words. Remember our old English teacher? Is there anything I should be concerned about? I wait to see what Joss will tell him. She's the one who wanted to call the cops when my father sent all that money. Will she tell him the whole tangled story? Will she tell him I'm a clone? I was just out jogging, I say too loudly. I tripped and hurt my leg. I lean forward, letting the hair slide in my face, because if Offer Bridgman knows Joss in kindergarten, he probably knew Elizabeth, too. But I want so badly to look up at Joss to see if she's going to back up my story. Oh no, I think. She's a minister. What if she's taken some oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, at all times? At the risk of being recognized, I glance up quickly. Joss and Officer Bridgman are staring at each other. And I sure hope they had some sort of romantic past together. Maybe they were high school sweethearts before one of them broke the other's heart. If not, they were spending way too much time looking at each other without talking. My cousin is quite the athlete when she's not injured, Joss says finally, a little faintly. I'd ask you to give us a ride back to Mom's house, but then you'd probably have to fill out a lot of paperwork, justify the trip to taxpayers in the Sanderfield Reporter. I've got to drive out that way anyhow, Officer Bridgman says, so I can break it to Mrs. Wade that she's not the next Sherlock Holmes. I don't necessarily have to report in my paperwork that I have passengers. I have the feeling that they've negotiated something. I don't quite understand. Officer Bridgman and Joss help me into the police car. I sit in the back behind the screen that's supposed to separate the criminals from the cops. Joss sits up front. Did you know that other guy who stopped? And the black car? Joss asks. No, Officer Bridgman says. That was a rental car from out of town. The plates weren't local, and there was a decal on the bumper. Why? He wasn't bothering you, was he? No, Joss says slowly. He just offered to help. I forget that my leg is throbbing, because suddenly my head feels like it's going to explode. It's all that I can do not to scream at Joss right in front of the policeman. But he knew our names. How did he know our names? Chapter 27 Officer Bridgman takes forever helping me into the house, saying hello to Merley, joking about how kindergarten taught him everything he knows, saying goodbye to Joss, and telling her to stop by the station sometime if she ever gets bored visiting, visiting Merley. The minute he finally leaves and Merley shuts the door behind him, I burst out. How did he know our names? Little Rai Rai, Merley says, looking confused. Why, we've known the Bridgman family since. Not Bridgie, Joss says. This other guy he drove up when we were sitting on the courthouse lawn. Merle's eyes look troubled as she bustles around getting antiseptic and gauze and bandage tape for my leg. But her voice is calm as she tells Joss, Oh, you remember what it's like living in Sanderfield. Everybody knows everybody else's business. How old was this guy? 
It was probably somebody who knew your father, or even your grandfather, a billion years ago. Brady said he had an out-of-town rental car, and the guy didn't just know me, he knew Bethany, Josh says. Mom, how many people even know that Bethany's here? Everyone at school, because I had to explain why I took the day off Friday. Mrs. Sells next door, because she saw Walter's car pull up on Thursday night. And of course, Ron Boulderfer's mom, and Tammy Silgo saw her at the Y, Marley says distractedly. Bethany, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to take those pants off before I can put this bandage on. Embarrassed, I unfasten my jeans and ease them down. My t-shirt is long enough that it covers me practically down to my knees. I stood in front of total strangers in less clothes than this at swim meets. But I'm skittish after the conversation with my mom. The strange encounter in the town square. I'm half afraid Merle and Joss will look at my knees and say, Here's our proof. Elizabeth's kneecaps look just like yours. But Merle's preoccupied with dabbing antiseptic onto the gash above my ankle. And Joss is still interrogating her mother. How many of those people remember Bethany's name? Joss asks. How many would tell it to some strange guy from out of town, who just happened to be in the town square, an otherwise deserted town square, I might add, at ten o'clock on a Monday night, when Bethany and I need help? Merle eases a gauze trip over my wound. Joss, I think you might be blowing this out of proportion, she says quietly, cutting her eyes from Joss and me and back. Walter never told me to keep Bethany's presence here secret. I'm sure Joss can read Merle's expression as well as I can. It says, calm down. Don't upset Bethany. We can talk about all of this later. I suddenly realized I've spent my whole life watching that same look pass between my parents. Joss isn't blowing anything out of proportion, I say. I swallow hard. I feel so naked and exposed in my underwear and t-shirt, in my body that I might be an exact copy of Elizabeth's. But I'm not going to be left out of this conversation. Were you able to trace my mother's call? Merle shakes her head. It turns out if the phone company traces the call, they send that information to the police. So I didn't do that. She won't meet my eyes. She's focused on pressing the bandage tape firmly across the gauze over my wound. Then she's done, and she has to look up. The lady at the phone company said I couldn't do dial back for a one-time fee without anyone else knowing about it. I tried that, but it just rang and rang and rang. And then the lady took pity on me and told me your mom must have used one of those gas station cell phones. Is Merle's news supposed to make me feel better? I remember a school assembly we had last year, when some police officer came and talked about personal safety. He said there'd be been a big campaign by some charity to put cell phones in ladies' restrooms and all sorts of public places, like gas stations and malls. Runaways, abused women, kidnapped victims. Anyone can use those phones, the police officer said, and no one can tell where you're calling from. Well, duh, if you're being kidnapped, wouldn't you want someone to know where you were? One of the kids in my class yelled up to the stage. I mean, no one outside of the law enforcement, the policeman said, like we'd all been stupid not to figure that out. Last year, I hadn't thought those phones would ever have anything to do with me. I wonder suddenly if my mother could be considered a runaway, an abused woman or a kidnap victim, or maybe all three. If we go to the police, I say slowly. Not yet, Merle says, avoiding my eyes again. Let's sleep on it, all of us. Joss, I hope you weren't still thinking you'd drive back to St. Louis tonight. Is there any way you could wait until morning? I'm not going back to St. Louis, Joss says. I'll call the church tomorrow and tell them I need to take some time off. I'm staying right here. She stares down fiercely at Merle and me. Her dark hair flared out from her face like a helmet, the torn knee in her blue jeans hanging down like a badge of honor. I'm so glad that she's not leaving, but her announcement scares me too. If she is staying, that means she believes that there's something to be afraid of. I feel like we are battling down the hatches, lifting the drawbridge, locking the shutters, preparing for some huge storm or battle or revelation. But I don't know what's coming. How can I understand what lies ahead of us when I don't even know who I am?